SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952. On tonight's SoCal Connected. LA's jazz roots run deep. Over time, they've dried up. 10 years ago, we were just in a drought, just a jazz drought, jazz club drought. But the sounds are flowing again. Los Angeles is definitely having a moment. I'm sensing that the audience is growing. In a city full of struggling artists, jazz musicians are hitting their stride. When I got here, it felt like it gave me permission to really explore every avenue of my like, creativity. And I don't think you're gonna catch that like anywhere else right now. Not the way that's happening here. This is Jazz City. I just did what I felt someone needs to do. I was doing what I wanted to do. This place is so hidden and usually dark, especially during the day, nobody knows it's here. And even at night, it's very dark and very hidden. So some people say it's belly, uh, belly of the whale. It's tucked into the corner of a shopping complex in Little Tokyo, next to a Korean barbecue house. It's discreet, but that's part of its draw. I'm not a very showy person. I mean, personally, I'm not a very showy person. Yeah, Benny Maupin, he walked in for the first time. I still remember, he walked in for the first time. And then he said, I, I heard about this place in June. Uh, um, it's good that you don't have a sign out there like live jazz because um, we know that scare people away. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> it may not look like much, but the Blue Whale is one of the most sought out jazz clubs on the West Coast. It's the centerpiece of LA's blossoming jazz scene. Because it's hidden, we don't have that much bar hoppers. So, you know, people who come here, they know what we are. I provide a space to all the local musicians here. We build it together. They help me a lot. And Miguel is one of them. He's talking about Miguel Atwood Ferguson, an LA native and a star of a sold out show on a recent Friday night. June Lee, the creator and the owner of Blue Whale, he's done a great job to create a dependable place here for people where it, they don't even need to know who's performing. They can know that they can show up and just have a, a very amazing experience. Fans and artists have June Lee to thank for helping re-energize jazz music in Los Angeles. He's an immigrant from South Korea and opened the Blue Whale in 2009. I used to sleep here, especially first year, because I was worrying about everything. Every day I wake up and, you know, it became my habit that, okay, I'm going to survive today. If it goes wrong, and don't get freaked out. His family back in South Korea wasn't crazy about his choice to open a jazz club. No, 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 no. They're all like... No, you're not doing it. <laughs> so my mom will always say, she still showed me the picture when my hair was black. And June, look at this. The black hair is before Blue Whale. The gray hair is after Blue Whale. They're still worrying about it. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's not, it's not secret. I mean, running up a jazz club. 
His interest in jazz began while bussing tables in Manhattan. He heard a Chick Corea track that inspired him to move to Los Angeles and study as a jazz vocalist. But he put his career as a musician on hold to open the club. The space that became the Blue Whale was formerly a rundown karaoke bar. It was a totally different place, and I didn't have a piano, no nothing. It's funny, because I'm when I picked this place, when I came to this place, the elevator was near. So I thought that, oh, it's going to be really convenient for all these musicians because they're, they're carrying all these the heavy instruments. But that elevator never works. When it went on the market, June saw its potential. He transformed it into a sleek listening room, complete with the work of mystic poets suspended on the ceiling. I was reading those, like, poets, and it may sound very silly, but I wanted to have their energy on the ceiling. I believe in my taste in music. I'd book the artist 100%. When I set up for the first time back in 2009, it was bad time. It was bad timing. I mean, the economy was not good. It, it, everything was going down. Listening rooms, like the Blue Whale, are rare. And in Los Angeles, venues like these have had their fair share of challenges. The economics, particularly in a booming, consistently gentrifying and evolving city like Los Angeles, makes almost any arts endeavor kind of a fraught proposition. LA hasn't been known in recent years for having venues that are really open to the more kind of like I don't want to say avant-garde, but, but more far-reaching, creative corners of jazz. Um, and the Blue Whale was really, we needed it. When I first started covering jazz in LA, it was kind of a dire thing. There was definitely a concern of, is this still a viable art form in terms of supporting a club that can just play this? When the Blue Whale is going on its 10th year, seven nights a week, the doors open at 8 p.m. The club transforms from an empty box into a room full of eager listeners. It's our temple. It's where we, it's we all go to a real special place when we perform because the venue's set up for the listening experience. Audiences are witnessing a special moment of freedom in LA's jazz history, where experimentation is encouraged. Some beautiful moments in all that music and tapestries of color and sound. Interesting ideas that straight ahead, the straight ahead jazz community possibly has shied away from. I think what makes the music so special is that it's not tied to any specific genre or expectation of what something is supposed to sound like. Because it's just a different kind of improvisatory genre. The Blue Whale came into the picture at the perfect time. I feel as if one of the key moments was the opening of the Blue Whale in Little Tokyo. That had such a shift in what the expectations were for a night out of seeing jazz. A lot of those artists from LA and beyond had a place to play where they didn't necessarily have to be tied down to any sort of expectations of playing more straight ahead music. That moment came just before a period of explosive growth and attention on the jazz music coming out of Los Angeles. L.A. natives such as Kamasi Washington and Terrace Martin, among many others, gave the city a newfound stamp of approval in the world of jazz. This sort of national, international credibility of like, oh wow, people play jazz in Los Angeles. Early in his career, Kamasi was often at the Blue Well. Sometimes he just comes when he, his friends play, he just come and just play a tune. We used to have him like, you know, once or twice a year, but now it's a little 
to a small forehand. Today, the music is being embraced by a generation that's grown up with hip hop. It's a wide and increasingly young audience. But a decade ago, while June was preparing to open the Blue Whale, the music was struggling to find a home. Back then, especially in LA, there are not many places that people go there and play what they really want to play. 10 years ago, we were just in a drought. In some ways, we still are. Just a jazz drought, jazz club drought. When we came here, there was no, I mean, there was the building, but not a single light, <laughs> not any businesses, nothing. And right across the street in this building, it was an ancient laundry and most of the windows were broken, you know, big old funky dark, you know, nothing, just us. Ruth Price founded the Jazz Bakery, a popular club that used to be in Culver City. You were seeing room and board, which was where the bakery used to be. And it's a furniture store. And it's got a clearance going on. From 1992 until 2009, the Jazz Bakery was a fixture in LA's jazz community. Culver City was a different place back then. It's very hard to tell because it doesn't look the same. But I think it was right there. Our entrances was built around that doorway. I don't even think this exists. It didn't exist. A lot of memories. Mostly all good. It hosted some of the greatest jazz artists of its time. everybody except Sonny Rollins, so we could never afford Sonny Rollins. That's about it. You name it. It's very hard to, to give you a list. I can't even begin to remember all the people. I mean, it's been endless. Think of all the nights and all the people and all the incredible players. Oh, Ruth. <laughs> How did I connect it with Ruth? It was just a natural happening for me to end up at the Jazz Bakery. Here's a photo I took uh, probably uh, around 1998 or 1999. And it's uh, Benny Green, Russell Malone, and that was just the two of them that night, and they were just fabulous. Bob Barry has been around for decades, photographing jazz in Los Angeles, including many legendary performers. He recently became Jazz Bakery's official archivist. That place was a, a unique place in, the, in that it wasn't a restaurant, and it wasn't a nightclub, it was a place to hear jazz. The idea of the Jazz Bakery began in 1992. It wasn't going to have any people drinking or talking. It wasn't going to have any green spotlights on a piano that was painted white and wasn't tuned. It wasn't going to have anybody smoking long before that was a consideration of law. And uh, that's what I did. It really became very important. People miss it. They still talk about it. Gentrification and higher rents swept into Culver City, and the jazz bakery lost its lease. Price has struggled for the past decade to find a permanent space. She continues to host events, but the locations are temporary. It's harder. It's harder always to go different places. It's not even harder. If not for me, it's harder for an audience. They don't have a place in mind where they can go. The Jazz Bakery closed the same year the Blue Whale opened. I didn't even know that it was, that was the same year. I didn't even know. So, yeah, I was really surprised. It, I was very, very sad about it. Los Angeles has a rich jazz history. Many clubs have come and gone before the Blue Whale or Jazz Bakery ever existed. One of those was the Finale Club, a venue where Charlie Parker and Miles Davis famously played in 1946. It was also in Little Tokyo. During World War II, this corner of downtown was coined Bronzeville, the name given when African American communities moved in after Japanese Americans were forced into internment. And it's also the point where Central Avenue stretches south, 
the main thoroughfare that was once home to the most famous jazz clubs on the West Coast. Central Jazz took place not that far from here, you know, and, you know, we have people like Billy Higgins and Mingus, you know, and Dexter Gordon, you know, and Eric Dolphy, all from Los Angeles, you know, playing music here. The Avenue was also the focal point of LA's black community from the 20s until the 50s. Ultimately, those populations were pushed south and west. Even if you're not a fan, there is no denying the cultural and historical significance of jazz in LA and in America. They say it's America's first art form. It's created by musicians that, um, you know, we're, we're looking at dealing with the toughest issues of civil rights and racism and bigotry. Somehow, America's forgotten that this music is so special. We've had a series of, I would call them like a renaissance type of feeling. You know, it happens in cycles, and I think we're at the start of a new cycle. So much so that a lot of people in New York at the top of their crafts are actually moving here to Los Angeles. New York has always been a jazz mecca. For decades, if you were serious about a career in jazz, it was the place to be. That's not necessarily the case anymore. Many artists are opting for Los Angeles. There's still a slight thing, I think, even after a year and a half, where I still feel like it's new to me. And I think it's just because I spent so much time in New York. One of those artists is Dave Benny. He holds a monthly residency at the Blue Whale. Blue Whale. Benny's lived in New York for 37 years and became a mainstay in the scene there. He's made over 20 albums under his own name and produced and played on hundreds more. Benny draws from the young pool of talent in Southern California. I'm trying to mix the, like the young crowd with like a more established crowd so that the scene kind of develops quicker. It's kind of really what I've always wanted to do, you know. Having the young people willing to dig into the music and learn it, that really is something that's a big part of Los Angeles for me. This evening, Benny's playing with pianist Paul Cornish. It's humbling because all the clubs are 21 and up. And when I got here, I wasn't 21. So for the longest, I couldn't even get into those clubs. And I started playing in a lot of them when I was like 19. So I would go and play and then still wouldn't be able to go and watch the shows. He's one of the up-and-comers that make appearances at the Blue Whale. The challenges of uh, being a jazz musician in 2019, just like not knowing what's next and how you can be really fruitful uh, in one week and the next week no one calls you or you can just come off a tour and uh, nothing's really happening. But I think that's part of it. I think that's definitely one of the things that drives me and pushes me to to keep going. By day, he is one of a hand-picked group of students at UCLA, learning from a jazz legend. The Herbie Hancock Institute for Jazz Graduate Program is one of the most prestigious of its kind. It's comprised of a seven-piece group of international students they study as an ensemble for two years under the tutelage of Herbie himself. I'm technically the teacher, <laughs> but I, I don't. I don't know. It, to me, it's a. Uh, um, it's almost like a partnership. Once it gets up to wh wherever it's going to go, then then. The other stuff can, can come through. Formerly the Thelonious Monk Institute, it was renamed in 2019 after briefly relocating to New Orleans. If you go to any of the jazz venues in the city, almost every night of the week, it's Monk Institute musicians, whether it's their own performance or they're playing with other artists.
They represent the future and are drawn to the renaissance happening here in LA. Los Angeles is definitely having a moment, especially with many people moving here, like uh, David Benny, um, another person, Theo Croker, because those are some people that I would have moved to New York to, to play with. <laughs> when I got here, it felt like it gave me permission to really explore every avenue of my like creativity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're gonna catch that like anywhere else right now, not the way that's happening here. I know that uh, there's an emphasis on, on the West Coast and LA in particular with jazz that's emerging here and developing here that's um, broader in a lot of ways than just the more strict tradition of, of jazz. Yeah, I think that's, that's played a big part too. These young players are forging a new path, but still, they embrace the history. I have 12 aunts and uncles, and they all play music. They grew up in uh, a low-income environment, so music was like a real um, saving grace for them. The history of jazz means a lot to me, especially being an African-American male. The music and the people in the music, a lot of them are African-American males who made success out of tragedy, out of traumatic and tragic circumstances of the times. And their success and their hard work and creative genius is so inspiring. It kind of just was passed down to me like a tradition. There are more jazz clubs opening, but not nearly enough to showcase the emerging talent flooding LA's music scene. That's definitely, I think, of concern. There's not a shortage of great creative thinkers in the arts in the actual presenting of the music, but we need some people to step forward and make some investments financially and otherwise. It's a boom-bust cycle just by virtue of the economics of it and how quickly that can change in a city like Los Angeles. It would be nice if we had two or three blue whales instead of just the one. It puts a lot of pressure on this one club to have to house or present all this music because there's really nowhere else like it. In a city that's constantly changing, the real challenge is for both the institutions and the music to be appreciated in the moment and stand the test of time. There's no doubt that more creative artists are going to continue to move to Los Angeles as it continues in this trend, I think. There's a lot of new artists that have a lot to say about this music, and this is a great home for them. I always tell people creativity is problem solving, so it's like getting into a problem or finding the solution uh, within changes and even beyond that. I feel like Los Angeles has been great for that because I haven't found too much judgment because everyone is sort of going for that thing and going into the unknown and reaching for, for something different. The scene in general sometimes can get confusing and it may be hard to find your focus in all of it because there's so many different sides and avenues and takes on jazz music, which is why I'm really appreciative of Los Angeles <laughs> because the place lets you be who you want to be. We're early in the game here, so maybe that's why the clubs aren't here. but. I'm sensing that the audience is growing. I'm very hopeful that the club scene will, will grow, but it can't just grow out of thin air. June Lee, it wasn't easy to get the blue whale to where it is now. And the future is always uncertain. This business with this music, it's not now, you know, I have everything, so I don't have to worry. In LA now, and especially in downtown LA, 
Because of the gentrification, the rent is just going up. It's just going up every year. There's just a lot of opportunity right now, and it's, it's a good time to be in Los Angeles to play music and hear music. How long we'll be able to say that, I'm not sure, but we can certainly say that now, and so we should just certainly enjoy it. <laughs>